The good old clap, take one. That's right. How many of you knew what you wanted to be when you were seven years old? I did. I wanted to be a world champion. Hey, is there honesty involved in this podcast? Can we be honest? We can shut your lips. And then I'll just say, put them up once. Let's go. He's like, you look too pretty on the wave. Get ugly. We can talk about DMT if you want. I talk to your boxes. <laughs> All right, so we have a two-time world champion and the defending Rip Curl Pro Bells Beach champion, Tyler Wright. Also, I'll say, since you've been on before, a friend of the pod, you're back on the lineup. Thank you for uh, coming back on, and, and how are you doing today? I'm doing really well. Thanks for having me. So I'm assuming, uh, based on the, the aviary background you got going on there, that you're back home in Australia, but maybe not down to Bells Beach yet. Where, where are you at right now? Yeah, I'm back home. I'm in Newcastle. Um, I'm about to. I'll leave for Bells today. Oh, well, we caught you. We caught you at the right moment. So yeah, you caught me at a good time. Yeah. So we are recording this. It's Tuesday, March twenty first. It's going to air a week later, Tuesday, March twenty eighth. And and you know, before we get into your interview, you and I are recording just hours out from your older brother Owen, who is a former world title contender and winner of multiple elite championship tour events or just an hour out from him announcing his retirement from full-time competition and and surfing in kind of heavier waves of consequence something that let's be honest he he was absolutely at the vanguard at for a lengthy period of his career just like a completely fearless uh surfer and publicly we know he suffered a traumatic brain injury warming up for pipeline in december 2015 and he's been very candid about his recovery, both the challenges and achievements in, in the subsequent eight years, uh, including amazingly, which I think it's, it's, it's worth mentioning, he won two championship tour events after he came back, Gold mm. Coast in 2017 mm. and pumping Chopu in, in 2019. And, you know, our, our conversation today is going to focus on, on the majesty of Tyler Wright for sure. But considering how close you and your brothers are together and, and broadly your whole family, it's probably worth spending a few minutes just talking about it. Um, yeah. And, and I'll start by maybe asking, you know, how close were you to sort of the private conversations he was having about retirements and, and what were your thoughts kind of through that process? Look, I think as, as we got older and as we, you know, kind of matured and everyone got their own lives a little bit more, um, there has been some really nice separation in those conversations because I think to a certain extent, you know, it's really easy to cross boundaries when you – are so familiar with someone's career. You really can, especially as a sibling. Mm. So I think as someone that has watched and kind of just watched his career and I have my personal opinion and then there's obviously a professional one and to see him, you know, really take his health into consideration to really kind of go taking so many hits to the head in waves of consequences where he, you know, he's exceptional. You look at Tahiti, he's one of the best to ever do it at Tahiti, um, one of the best to do it in big waves. And, you know, you know, as someone that loves him and respects his career, I think he's made a really um, amazing choice for himself mm. and for his family. And um, he's had an incredible career and endured so much as well. You know, I think the public only saw so much yeah. of his injury. Sure. Um, and – and, uh, you know, everyone's, like, learning more about concussion and TBIs and and that space is kind of opening up a lot more, uh, especially within surfing. But, yeah, it, it, it comes with consequences for sure. And so I think, yeah, I'm really proud of him for making the choice that he has. Uh, really proud that he's had such an amazing career. He's, um, like you said, he's won events, he's been in world title races and he, and he won a an Olympic medal, mm. um, which I think for him was kind of like the icing on the cake for him and his career and to really be like, all right, like, um, yeah. But as for conversations, you know, I, a sibling, I, I, I find it's best if we kind of just let individuals make their choices and, and support whatever that choice is. Makes sense. You know, I, I guess you know, having had the pleasure of knowing you both for, um, 
Oh, geez, you won Manly in 2008. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Owen was a wild yeah. card at Bells in 2007. So yeah, it's been 15, 16 years. And I think yeah. all of us have kind of been through quite a bit. But but one of the things that I've had the privilege of observing, and, and certainly a portion of which was documented uh, quite beautifully in, in Make or Break Season 2, is just how close mm. your family is with one another. Um, mm. and, and when it comes to your own surfing, you know, if you had to distill what kind of specific influence Owen had on your surfing uh, growing up, what would it be? And then, you know, has that changed in recent years? You know, I think you can see the influence a lot through the younger years. Mm. Um, I, I think it was just the environment and the culture that we were in at home. And, you know, you ha- I had every sibling surfed. And, and two, obviously, that went above and beyond exceptional at it as well. So I think when you look at some of the bigger heavy wave stuff, you know, the both of them have always been there, like Owen and Mikey. Um, Owen is probably more the notorious Rip Curl Trip ones um, on the search. So, like, you got P-Pass and Tahiti. Um, and he's done both of them with me. And, you know, I think that essence of kind of, understanding bigger waves, understanding bigger wave uh, consequences is actually how to ride them. Mm. And as well, like, you know, the one bit of advice I think Owen gave me, and I, I still use it to this day, um, is, is when it comes to big waves, he's like, never take the small ones. Mm. Never take the small ones. And I'm like, why? And he's like, there's more water on the reef for those bigger ones. So go the bigger ones, you know, go the smarter ones. Um, and I've always, I still use that now. Like we have such ways of consequences on tour now right. um, in recent years for the women more so than we did um, previous in the last decade. So I use that bit of information essentially wherever I go. And I've had that for the last, yeah, probably 12 years. He said that to us. And I just remember because it's, you know, I, you see so many people hit the reef on small waves. Um, and I, you know, I think, you know, it's just a little bit of influence. But, yeah, over the years and then, you know, obviously as you get older, you know, I kind of define my career and each sibling kind of define their own careers. And we had, like, a fair few degrees of separation um, just with personality and, and what each individual wanted. So I think – yeah, like you can see the influence uh, definitely through the younger years and we're all driven mm. to – but we're not driven in like a I just want to beat them. I don't. Um, you know, it's also part of the reason like you'd, in my family I didn't, never really thought that I was that good mm. because I had siblings that were so much better. Mm. Um, so it's one of those ones where you just kind of – you grow up and that's just the environment and so normalised. Well, uh, you know, fortunately for all of us, uh, Owen is uh, certainly going to continue to surf. We're even going to see him as a wild card at the upcoming Rip Curl mm. Pro Bells Beach, which will be awesome. Um, but let's let's continue to shift the focus back to you. Um, mm. You're the defending Rip Curl Pro Bells Beach champion. You are coming into this event ranked fourth in the world. It's been a pretty good start to 2023 so far for you. Why don't we kind of take it from the top in terms of Entering the year after a pretty quick holiday window, right? We come straight into Hawaii, straight into yeah. pipe. Where's your mind at? You know, what's the goal for the season? You know, are you taking it event by event? Are you mapping it out in halves? Do you have like end of the year goals? And then, and then just how did you feel, I guess, physically and surfing wise at the start of the season? Yeah, like I spent like a lot of time preparing for this year. Mm-hmm. I think I spent more time than I've ever spent. Um, in a preseason, you know, working with Andy King, mm. um, who's, who's come on to be my coach and as well as, uh, Jason Patchell, um, who's my psychologist and I've worked with him for like five years now and we've never really done like performance stuff. We've always kind of like, I obviously have lived a chaotic life. Um, so <laughs> so it's always kind of, there's always, there's been so much to do outside of, uh, the arena um, so it's, it's always been really focused on that. And this is the first time, um, in probably, you know, really since like what, 2017, mm. um, that I've been in the physical and mental space to actually put energy into, to a year. Mm. 
and and what that looks like. So yeah, we spent quite a bit of time working on on my surfing, on where we want to go next and what we want to kind of do, um, you know, and really worked on the mentality for me of why I'm showing up, why I'm doing this. You know, I get to a certain point in my career where I've done everything I've ever dreamed of. Mm. Um, and I understand people like, surely you want to do more, surely you want to do this. But I think that's a really external expectation of me. It's not my own expectation. Um, you know, I've lived a big life. I've, I've achieved more than I could ever imagine mm. um, that I, you know, and I'm still here. And I'm so I'm kind of, we had to spend time into my why. We mm. had to look at why I was at these events. We had to look because honestly, you know, at, at certain times you don't really want to be 10 months out of the country. Sure. You know, you know, and I kind of saw that a little bit in Portugal. Um, you know, I started really well and I had my full team in in um, in Hawaii for the, the two events. So I had Lily, my wife, and I had um, Kingy and mm-hmm. Jason for majority of both of those events, and which was amazing. It's the best I've ever felt competing, mm. um, having those two there. And I think having a psychologist on the beach has been groundbreaking for me personally and through an event because events kind of get hectic mm. um and i feel like things always hit the fan in hawaii um on multiple sure. levels um and so yeah like when we when i went to portugal i didn't have that support and although i had really good coach support it still wasn't i didn't have lily there i didn't have mm. the people that had kind of are really ground in or grounded in the reason why i'm showing up mm. and i felt you know i could feel that as just you know you get to a point where you say I don't want to be away this long right (laughs) and so it's it's really kind of balancing that understanding hey look like um there's going to be moments like that and it's also really important to have um a a team that that's around you that understands that this is not what everyone says it is for me specifically Mm. it's the reason why I'm doing it um is just my own so. Right. You know, we've been we've been kind of harping on this all season long, like, you know, the schedule of, of really everything we do, but specifically the CT is designed to maximize like this is the these are the best conditions you can get all year. Right. So even kind of shifting pipe end of January, early mm. February is really prime season compared to where we used to have it in December. Mm. Sunset's the same, you know, super tubos for right in that window. But luck of the draw so far in 2023 and i think a little bit of this la nina weather cycle is we're just just kind of outside of it or we're not getting kind of Mm. an entire window of classic conditions there's Mm. a lot of hard days and and Mm. going back to that preparation both physically and mental i'd be interested to get your take on what mattered more because i could entertain a scenario where it's like everyone on tour is such a good surfer and they can deal mm. with consistent conditions at world-class waves. It's when you get those events where it's like, we're off for mm. three days, the wind's bad, oh, the swell's half the size. Like That seems mm. like a much more mentally taxing thing on a surfer to p- perform through the whole window. For sure. I think it, it just depends what your team's outlook is. Mm. Like if you're having to change equipment, if you're having to change board, like fins, setups, if you're not prepared for a marathon, if you're like a pre- prepared for a full-on sprint, it is hard to change gears. Mm. Like even having the two back to back in um, Hawaii from pipe to sunset, it is so hard to change gears. You know, pipe. You know, it is what it is. Like high consequence, um, and it's quick. Whereas sunsets high consequence, and it's kind of slow and fat. Like it, it changes from all like it's steep end sections or it's mm. you know it. It is a lot. I think I struggled shifting gears from pipe to sunset. Um, you know, like I think at pipe, the conditions that we're in was kind of like fast jabby turns, mm. um, quick barrels, and then an end section. Whereas like when you transition over to sunset, the sort of surfing that you have to do, you have to downshift mm. um, quite a few gears to really fit in with the wave there. Um, and, you know, I – obviously adjusted to a certain extent, but I don't really think I performed it that well um, in the sense of my surfing. I think I went back to a, a surfing that's kind of a bit more familiar um, than what I would have actually liked to have done. But it is hard when you have, we were surfing the point one day mm. and I'm surfing inconsistent bowl 
sort of thing. Um, and, you know, you'd go out, it'd be pumping for two heats and then go dead flat and there's not a single wave. So, you know, I remember, and that's how I lost at sunset was that there was two waves that came in the side of the heat, but they kind of came off and wide and you, you know, you're never going to take them. And then um, I think Pickles went for two medium ones, got backup scores, which is a really smart play in the end mm. because no set came through. No wave did until the last 30 seconds. And by that point, um, I couldn't get a, I couldn't get a four to save me. So, which meant that I couldn't try and convert the last wave that I had. So, you know, I think conditions like that are just, it's a part of the game. It's a part of what we prepare for. I don't think, I think it's surprising anyone that we're having challenging like that, it's all challenging. There's not one bit that's easy. I think the minute you think it's easy, the minute that it's got you. Looking at that idea of having, you know, the the support group around you physically to, to keep you grounded, you know, if you're going from maybe one extreme in Portugal where you didn't have the same group and you're probably about as far as you get from home and looking mm. ahead to, you know, the Rip Curl Pro Bells Beach, which is celebrating its 60th anniversary this year. It's the hometown mm. of your longtime sponsor. It's an event that you're the defending event champ for. I'd imagine you'll have that network of a physical presence there. Um, a, is that right? And then B, if so, like, how do you ensure that it's not all too much, right? Because sometimes it feels like you see people with so many people around them that it's hard to keep the, the tight unit together and focus on the goal at hand. Look, like, um, yeah, that is right. I'll have my whole team there again. I'll also have, because of O's retirement, mm. have excess family members and things like that. Um, I'm pretty strict with boundaries, um, like I'll go down 10 days before I'll make sure that I'll get every rip curl commitment done, um, up until like five days out to the comp. And then those five days before the comp are my standardized five days before the comp, like I'll have WSL commitments, but generally I won't do anything else right. other than what I would have in my regular schedule. Um, I think more now than ever, I've realized that. I think for me in the, in the kind of stage of life and career that I'm in, it means a lot to be working with the people that I want to work with. I don't, you know, I think as you, as you progress in your career or as you go through your career, your values change for it. I think when you're young, it's so easy to be so ambitious and so, yep, I've got what it takes. Mm. I've, I can do this. Like you're so driven. There's so much energy into it, um, which is so fantastic. But I think when you get older and, and you have achieved kind of what you wanted to achieve, um, you kind of get a lot more, I feel for me, a lot more choices. You have a lot more of a choice. You have in the sense of um, – because you're not driven and it's sometimes it's hard to be not so driven by that one thing, like wanting to win multiple, multiple world titles, wanting to be the best, wanting to do this. And that doesn't mean that I don't want any of those things. I do. I work extremely hard um, to be my best. I work extremely hard to, and have worked extremely hard to bring my body back and bring my mind back. You know, I think it's easy to kind of like even I forget that, you know, bring my body back was a mission in and of itself. I dropped 18 kilos. Like you just – I was tiny um, when I came back in 2019. So I – you know, my values and why I have to show up and why I do show up is, is kind of have shifted and I think it's cool to be able to recognise that. No, I won't have the same energy and ambition that certain athletes have, but I think for me, mine – what drives me is working with the best people, mm. um, working with the best people for me and and having that, I think it's been really important as well. Like I, I do start to see environment, like it's been a few years since I have been back, but I, I, I guess my life's changed a lot in those few years. Of course. Um, and, and so having people that actually kind of uh, – I'm not so involved in surfing. Are also really nice, if that makes sense. Like surfing's a really small and at times insulated arena. And for someone like myself, who kind of 
fits in but doesn't fit in. Um, it can also become semi overwhelming because I, I don't, I, you know, it, it is at times frustrate a frustrating arena mm. um, as well. So it is really important to have those people around. Um, and that's what I've really found in the last probably <laughs> like 12 months for sure is to be surrounded by people that, you know, I can show up to these events and, and still do really well, but when my heart and soul in, in these events, it's generally when my, when I get to work with the people I want to work with and, um, yeah. Yeah. I- I love that. And it's actually a perfect tee up to our, our upcoming segment, but we're going to take a quick break to get a word in from our sponsors. And when we come back, we're going to dive into exactly what Tyler's talking about just then. We'll be back. So, so when we left off for break, Tyler, uh, uh, as a perfect segue, because I do think it's so important to have a conversation about this topic, because let's face it, you were a wunderkind, you know, you, you won so, so young, sponsors so, so young, like so much achievement young, and you're 28, and you could argue, like, objectively, you've got at least five, maybe 10, maybe 15 high-level performance years in you physically, but psychologically, it's almost fair to expect that, it, it's, not, it's not exactly fair to expect that your hunger when you were 14 and winning is the same at 28. And you spoke a little bit about that before the break, but I, I'm so interested in this. Yeah, no, it's 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 one of those ones where I, at times, I find that I'm like, I would love to be, have that same hunger. Like I, at times I would, it's almost easier. It's almost easier to show up when you're just so driven and it's, it's like there's nothing else there. Um, you don't particularly know. I didn't really know why I was driven and that was the other thing Mm. I think with age you get perspective and obviously I've worked with Jason my psychologist for the last five years and unfortunately at the time like I didn't have a choice I had to look like I was on the road since I was 13 and a decade later I was kind of forced to stop so in that time I was forced to look um, at some of the things like it's really easy to run mm. hard when you you know your home life is a mess sure um you know your your upbringing was kind of a mess you there's so many things that are, are so complex and so hard to contextualize that it's just so easy to head in that direction and that's it um but I think yeah like you said with age um, perspective and obviously life experience and having a psychologist to help us kind of like really filter through it. Like, yeah, I don't have the drive, Mm. um, of, of that 14 year old me, but I think what I probably got more wisdom, um, which comes in handy. I can probably understand now more than ever is like how to manage an event, how to manage myself, how to, um, kind of approach all these different things. And as I think when I was younger, I just buckle up. It is what it is. Like you, you're doing it. There's no choice. There's no option. Now my life and my internal world is a lot more of the landscape is a lot more gentler for me. Um, and I think I've worked really, really hard. You know, it's it's hard to be a wonder kid. It's hard to be, uh, you know, touted to be the next best thing, right. to be, you know, at 14 you're going to be a world champ um and I think too like it it's kind of like now like um more than ever like I look at I had some pretty hectic influences you know I think my dad was pretty gnarly it's taken me a long time to to really understand him Mm -hmm. and how he kind of um pushed this and I didn't you know I think that's one of those things like I think I'm really conscious when I watch the next generation and I see, you know, over, you know, uh, involved parents. Sure. And, you know, it's kind of one of those things where you just, you watch and you're just like, how many times does this have to happen right. before parents can really look at themselves and go, look like, yeah, my kid can be here, but at some point I'm not going to have a relationship with my kid because of, the support that I thought I was doing the best, that I had the best intentions with, that I had this. Mm. Um, 
has really ended up actually being forms of different emotional and psychological abuse if you're not really informed. Yeah. And so I experienced that and I've worked with a psychologist for years to understand my relationship with surfing and understand my relationship and how that was actually born and kind of how it was really unhealthy for me. Mm. Um, and, and some of the, you know, when I look back, it's still to this day, I'm still finding things that because of that environment are actually handbrakes in my professional career. And they've always been handbrakes. Mm. Um, you know, and I'm really lucky that I have a team that's, that's amazingly well equipped that understands that, Hey, look like I'm rebuilding a relationship with surfing because of the drastic Mm. and kind of extreme circumstances that I was raised in. Yeah. Well, and that's, it's so interesting to hear you talk about that because it's not inconsistent with really like any performance based industry, really any sport or entertainment or whatever, like the common through line. And we have this conversation so often is that, you know, the, some of the best surfers on the planet and almost to a person, every single one of our world champions has come from a broken home kind of situation. Right. And that mm. that's mm. twofold causal, right? Because on the one hand, as you pointed out, it's like the ocean becomes like a surrogate parent and a place to escape. You're spending way more time there than the average kid. So by function of that, you're getting to be very, very good, but also, mm. and something that psych- sports psychologists talk about a lot is as unfortunate as it is for human beings, like hate and anger and sadness are hugely motivating emotions, right? In terms Mm, of mm. I'm going to get stronger, I'm going to get faster, I'm going to get better. And I'm interested to hear your thoughts on that because as someone like yourself who admittedly you're, you're, you're becoming a more complete person, you, you know, you have real true love in your life, et cetera. The share of voice that, you know, hate and anger and, and depression had in your life it, it's smaller, mm. right? And and as such, mm. you kind of have to compromise the performance motivation or figure out mm. how to, as you pointed out, like, what does this mean to me? What's my relationship with surfing now? No, like it's the, look, like, like you kind of said, it's, this is not uncommon, mm. um, which is also kind of baffling for someone like me to be like, okay, if this is not uncommon, why don't we have better solutions? Mm. Why don't we have better parent programs? Why don't we have better informed you know, industry, like this is not, I'm not the first child that this has happened to. I'm not the first, you know, child star that this has happened to Mm. across every industry. You you find this and it's, it's like people are surprised. Mm. It's like people are surprised that we get to this age and we turn around and get to some point and go, absolutely. You're done. You're done in my life. You're out. I don't want you near it. Um, And then you watch that individual then go and, you know, what if they don't know how to ask for help? Mm. I didn't, I know I didn't at 18. And the way I expressed that was, I don't want to win world titles because F you guys, Mm. you've put so much attention and pressure on me for this, but you not have, have not once looked at my life. You, You, there's no, there's no context of, Hey, I've been out of school since I was 14. Mm. I'm clearly academic, clearly have a whole bunch of these things, but my environment wasn't conducive to kind of who I was. And I understand there's like a boundary because parents are parents and that's their responsibility. Um, I think with my father, you don't, I don't think there was a lot of room to breathe. Mm. Um, I think it, you know, is a quite a intense man. So, but I think there is a lot of parents out there that want to do well. They want to, they want to learn. They want to be educated. They just sometimes, potentially could be looking in the wrong spots. And I think, you know, it's, it's one of those ones where mine was like surfing became protection, you know, Mm. surfing. If I did well, that means no one could touch me. Like, so my world titles became about safety and protection. Um, And it's looking at that is because once I won, no one in my family could say anything. Right. They were done. Your opinions are done. I, I've, I've done it. I've settled this conversation. I get to live my life now. And you go and watch. Like after I've won two, I went and lived a whole complete life. And obviously, a lot of that was away from uh, surfing, sure. um, unfortunately. And and now coming back again, you, you get different 
you kind of bring different things and different understandings, but, um, you know, we kind of, there's so much anger, so much hurt, so much, um, also suppression of who I was and in the sense of just being in an environment where you have to survive is not really thriving. Mm -hmm. And that's one of those ones. Like I, I got so many skills because of the environment that I was in, but as an adult, those skills don't really help you. Right. They, you know, it's constantly being under threat, constantly being um, and feeling like you're unsafe is like a crazy thing to deal with as like an adult when you're just like, I'm at home, like I should be able to relax, but I can't. I should be able to sit down and, and watch a movie without freaking myself out, mm. but I can't. Whereas you put me in a comp, you put me in a jersey, fine. You know, it, it becomes this really weird transition where you've almost spent so much time in the water that that's where your normal is. But that normal is like at a heightened sense, you know, you're processing so quick, you're reading the ocean, you're reading the competitor, you're reading the environment, but you withdraw us from that. Um, it takes a long time to learn how to navigate your own life and, and kind of your internal dialogue outside of that because, you know, surfing is a small, really, really small part. Competing is a tiny part. Mm. Um, so it really becomes about the relationship you have with yourself and where that's been born from. Um, yeah, and for me it was, you know, it's, it's taken me a long time to really understand my environment as a child and how that kind of led to me as an adult and also not having the best coping mechanisms um, either. You know, the I love that. I mean, the paradox being a little bit right that the imp mm. the empowering incident that you talk about, where it's like I started winning, therefore I was empowered to say no. There's a mm. non-zero percent chance that your upbringing, the unhealthy upbringing, in a lot of ways, mm. contributed to you achieving that so early, right? And and so that creates yeah. uh, like, and I and you pointed out like there's got to be a better way. I, I wonder too. It's like it's kind of a no holds bar winner takes all capitalism broadly, like in professional sports. And yeah. it's like, there's mm. no, there's no incentivizing agent to be like, Hey, go a little bit slower. Like make, let's make sure they're as emotionally well adjusted no. as possible. It's like, well, for every, you know, 10,000 kids that might be martyrs, we're going to get one 17 year old world champ, you know? And that's exactly. like a little bit of the weird calculus in the system. And you know, you kind of got to look at, and that's, I think too, why the environment for me, you know, as I get older, is having my people around is more important now because I'm just like, how do you not see this? How do you not see that? Yeah, you, we can encourage this. I still see 15 year olds get on tour, 16, especially in the women's, mm. get on tour. And, and although, like, I can, and, and some of those young ones, I can appreciate their environment, but I'm also, they're also generally their environment is also they're around 40 year old white dudes. Mm. And I understand for some that might be great, but to a certain extent, I'm also seeing that those 40 year old white dudes don't actually know how the things that a, a 16 year old who has that skill set and how to balance mm. that without just going, well, they're going to be one of the best we can change that and you know you've got to really start to look at who's influencing those 16 year olds now and and kind of what generation they're from and and for us me personally like I've worked with a lot of people in this industry and it is a pretty white male dominated industry to be involved in and I guess when you kind of sit outside those lines um, in any way shape or form you know for me that's obviously my sexuality and and being queer and and kind of it makes you see surfing in a whole different light um and you know it makes you see the issues really really quickly mm. um around how some of these influences are almost it's it's crazy to me because I'm like all right this next generation we should be more, way more informed you know their mental health they they should be able to have these sort of things in place they should be have full full teams, really well prepared, mm. you know, their socialization is valued just as much as their competitive um, and their surfing. Like, but you can also see that it, it's not, 
And you're just like, how did they miss this again in another generation? How is this again, you know, like you got young kids, like, and I can see some of these young kids' fathers. Mm. And it's really confronting to see another generation with fathers that, you know, show narcissistic behaviors. Mm. And you just like, this is another generation and it's not like anyone's blind. Um, it's like the value on it though is someone is so exceptional. Mm-hmm. We're going to pay. Yeah. And, and that's, you know, how do you kind of industry rise change that? I obviously have a lot of conversations with Ripco and they've done a lot of work in this space. And, you know, I think they are, we're working on a program for athletes within within the Ritko space and I'm incredibly proud of that and I hope it does get pulled off in a way where it is it's a really insightful thing where it's it's based around the individual of the athlete and their needs because every athlete every young child is different and um you know I think it's it's one of those ones where I struggle more and more with the surf industry the older I get Mm. um purely because it seems like it's just cycling through again Um, and some of the things that I still today have to deal with, I'm just like, why is, why is this an issue? Like it's, it's baffling for me. It's baffling for my wife who, who's not from surfing, who comes in and is like, well, why are we in the, you know, the late eighties, early nineties when it comes to treating women, when it comes to treating queer people, Mm -hmm. when it comes to treating black indigenous and, um, people of color, like why, why intersectionally is this so far behind? Um, and, you know, I'm like, I agree. Like why emotionally are we so far behind? Why educationally are we so far behind? And that's, look, obviously that's my personal opinion, but that's coming from someone who doesn't really and hasn't really enjoyed the environment of surfing in the last decade. So I know other people are quite, love it and comfortable with it, but obviously I don't. <laughs> well, I, I mean, it's interesting to hear you talk about that too, right? Because there's so many agendas and motivations in the everyone get ready to drink yeah. surfing industrial complex, my favorite phrase, yeah. but, but like, it's so bizarre because there is this disconnect because, because historically, you know, the ocean doesn't give a shit who you are. It's going to let you in, right? Um, no, say exactly. everyone's treated yeah. the same. So you have like a yeah. pretty diverse cross section of, of ocean goers globally, Historically, yeah. right? Um, yeah. Genders, you know, nationalities, sexualities, et cetera. Again, the ocean doesn't really give a shit. A version of that enters surfing. And then on the other side of this bell curve is the output for the industry where like, we want to sell to more people. It's like, well, you rep, like the act of surfing is inclusive of a mm. lot of people that are potentially mm. your demographic. But then in the middle, you just get this weird historically mm. closed-minded kind of gatekeeper thing where you're like women need to mm. look like that mm. like men need to look like that and mm. but mm. as you pointed out as um admittedly i'm a 40 year old white man as of next month yeah. but no but it's but it's a good point like we've ran analytics <laughs> at the wsl in the past and they're like here's our audience and i'm like this is a problem like it's just me you know like yeah and, and it's like surfing is so much and I love bigger. You. i appreciate that but but, yeah. but you, you yeah. understand what i'm saying like surfing is so mm. much bigger than that and as someone who's had the privilege of watching your career for sure you mm. were marketable when you were young he's a young like dynamic mm. talented surfer mm. i would imagine though you've experienced your profile explode because it's married to your achievements but it's also married to you understanding who you are outside of the water Mm. and expressing Mm. that and and again Mm. like i'm not expecting everyone to have our same value system but if the output is like we want to make more money so we want to sell to more people it's like hey there's a bunch of proof cases where if you let people be who they are and are authentic and you're inclusive Mm. it is going to work Mm. Mm. yeah like it's it's one of those ones where um yeah, it's it's a weird thing. I I struggle with it actually quite consistently. I struggle with the whole the whole thing because I just sometimes think there is a lack of awareness and I you know like everyone is entitled to their own value system. Everyone is able to do that and I think but as a culture I think in a competitive sense and that's where I feel like you know um you know, when surfing comes from Indigenous backgrounds, you go to Indigenous cultures and you learn from Indigenous people. You look at 
their cultures and it's always been inclusive. There's always been um, space for everyone. And and that's kind of where surfing, you know, surfing is Indigenous. And so when you look at the competitive sense of surfing and, and kind of where it's gone to, it's like it is in, increasingly challenging I think for me personally and and look like I know there's a lot of people that love the way surfing is I I know that a lot of people thrive in this environment um and and I think that's amazing and it's incredible but I just know there's a few people that probably also feel that they can't really connect to too much within surfing they can't really be themselves in this environment even today like I celebrate anything queer it's like oh my god and I bring anything queer up or I I celebrate anything being queer it's like oh my god like stop trying to turn us gay do you know how many times I've heard that about celebrate like it's insane but that's coming from the next generation as well and you just but Gen Z is Mm. like that we've hanging out within the real, like in, as in outside of surfing, I just like correcting us nonstop it, people our age, if you know what I mean. So like, why is there such a gap with the next, like I find it challenging when I'm being faced with that, being faced with the same stuff from like over 15 years ago going, Oh my God, like mm. stop trying to turn us gay. Oh my God. Like I'm simply including myself and that's when in conversations where I'm just including myself I'm not saying anything other than like oh yeah you like you know like pregnancy comes up and it's like oh yeah like you know if you marry a man obviously and then or if you marry a woman there's a, a different options and they're like oh my god it's it's still a thing to this day and it's not I don't really look at that individual and be like hey like that's kind of semi-homophobic mm. I just go hey your environment is really challenging not to be that way. Mm. Your environment is really challenging that there's no one here going, hey, that's a really backwards way of thinking Mm. of going. And look, I understand that everyone has their own opinion and everything like that, but I still get that today. And I'm just like, and hanging out in the surfing environment for long periods of time, it's just like, oh my gosh, Um, it is a challenge. It's like on the tour today, like it's, you know, I think I'm the only queer person um, that is is comfortably out, is that is that is well and truly, um, you know, obviously I wear the progressive pride flag. I mm-hmm. I live who I am. That's just it. Mm. So, well, yeah. it, it's it's interesting too. Like we're always hearing like, and and I like uh, football slash soccer too, but like they're like soccer fans, football fans, like are the most passionate fans there are. I think for surf fans and, and surfers, it's it's even beyond that because surfer is so much of everyone's identity at the end of the day. Mm, so mm. however surfing is kind of being consumed by the masses, for, for a surfer whose identity is surfer, it's like, if that is not reflective of me, I'm going to get really upset. And I'm going to get upset at a magnitude that's way beyond, like, I am a fan. Because, and I, I'm trying to empathize, like, because they go, that's not who I am, right? And, and I think mm, there's a bit mm. of that, like, across a lot of this, too. But when you said, mm. oh, look, I'm, I'm dealing with the same shit I was dealing with 15 years ago... Yes, but by virtue of you being here and you being comfortable in who you are mm. and you performing, it is different. And and I think there's a little bit of like sure. Newton's third law of action and reaction. Like we, sw- yeah. we swing a little bit this way and then it swings back really hard, you know, but it's mm, it's mm. not without change. Like people are taking notice yeah. and it's it's. It is fascinating because because listening to you talk about it, it's you can apply that to so many things in surfing as well. And it's people just get really yeah. catalyzed and they're like, no, I don't want to talk. Yeah, well, and, and that's the thing. Like, I, I haven't really talked about this before. I don't talk about it because, look, like, it's it's something that, you know, I'm still semi – like, I get frustrated mm. and that's kind of the thing is it's like, yeah, I, I see so much, you know, it's one of those things where you kind of see change and then you'll see something that you just like, how? How is that the 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 – absolute storm of the century mm. you're just like how and you just 
it is one of those things where it is like me. I know me being here has been great um, for community. I know it's been great for the queer community and, and things like that. I struggle when I think people kind of like it is one of those arenas and, and environments where people just don't quite get it. Mm. And I think that's okay. I think surfing, and like you said, surfing is like an identity piece for a lot of people. And if you don't match that, I could, people get angry, mm. people get mad. And, and, and I think on the majority side, I think it's been, it's funny cause it's publicly, it's been like, obviously well, very well supported. And two, I don't quite mind. I, it's one of those ones where it's, I, I'm very happy with who I am. Mm. I, I really love who I am and I've worked really, really hard to have a really good relationship with who I am. And and that it does allow me to go into an environment where it is quite confronting at times. And, and you know, I think I get – I think my frustration comes from a little bit is like I feel like sometimes in certain situations I'm the only one that's teaching. Mm. Like, you know, it's one of those ones where I get asked a lot of questions and, and that's great, but it, to a certain extent it's like, there's no such thing as a small town anymore. Mm. There's no, because of social media, there's no such thing as a, as, Oh, we just didn't know. I'm like, have you Googled (laughs) before you, before you come out with these massive ridiculous statements? um, You know, and I think we, we saw that in, in when the trans policy came out for the WSL, Mm. you saw a lot of uninformed opinions that, were regurgitated mm. that there was, but I doubt that many people Googled how to talk about it. Mm. How do we have this discussion with so many complex nuances? How do we have this in a really mindful way that we're not dehumanizing anyone? We're not desensitizing this topic. And we're, we're actually bringing a lot of awareness to, to this subject. And how do we talk about it? But that whole thing was a colossal mess um, in my experience because I couldn't – I loved it. I thought it was – I think WSL having the policy is amazing. Mm. I think it's it's incredible. It's inclusive. It's it's moving forward. Um, but it's, it's one of those things where it was so confronting that, you know, to a certain extent I was being told to keep – keep quiet, keep my head down mm. because of how much of this was a blow up. Mm. And like, and that's the thing, like I didn't say much and, and I still don't. I just, obviously it's, it's wildly confronting for someone like me to be in the kind of crossroads of this mm. um, because of, you know, I believe in inclusivity mm-hmm. and equality. I, I, it's just, it just doesn't come and go and shift um, when I like it or when I don't like it or things like that, it's, it's one of those ones where you just, it's, yeah, I don't know. I just, I found that so confronting um, to be in that space in the bubble of surfing um, where there was so much misinformation. Well, and, it, and, oh, go on. Yeah. I was just going to say, and, no. and surfing, which fancies itself ideally is like progressive nonconformist, right? And exactly. even, even your point about the Googling thing, I think media literacy is like a huge thing that everyone inside oh. and outside surfing needs to do. But to your point of like, oh, they, they, they didn't even take the time to Google. Well, a lot of them probably think Google's run by lefties as opposed to like, hey, I got this off my uncle who got it off of Facebook. And like, and I guess that's the point. It's not like a judgment in either direction. It's like technology, no. technology has moved so fast and I don't think humans have done a great mm. job of like leveling out on how to interact with it appropriately. And, and if you're not yeah, trained yeah. in media literacy and you're just like, yeah, I mean, it's yeah. on a, it's on the internet. It must be true. It's on the news. That must be true. Then yeah. you're in a real struggle. You, you, you know, you mentioned, you mentioned how in 2023, motivation has been a huge part of your preparation and, and mm, how mm. certainly your motivation when you started out was winning world titles, but you even said maybe for the wrong reasons, you know, it, does this, what we've been talking about feed into your motivation of like, why am I here? Why am I still competing in 2023? I think it, at times it, it goes against it. Mm. Like I get really overwhelmed. I get really, um, yeah, I get really overwhelmed by it. I get really, 
kind of deflated at times as well because I'm just like it's a really it seems like too much especially like you know the North Shore with with everything that came up over there and I think people's like ability to kind of um yeah I don't know to dehumanize something to desensitize something I think it's all of this stuff um doesn't seem that hard to kind of really go, hey, look, like intersectionality is a thing. Mm. And like even though my experience of this particular thing is, say, uh, sits on the good side of stuff, Mm. um, somebody else's might not be. And it's really just going, hey, how do we as a community evolve forward? And that's really understanding that so many issues are nuanced. Like there's so much complicated, like there's so much in it and – I think, yeah, like, look, the North Shore was really intense this year. Mm. Um, lucky I did have a psychologist. I think it's it's one of those ones where I can see other athletes and I feel like they have the ability to focus on performance solely, mm. sole performance. Right. And I feel like there's other things like kind of what we've been talking about it just now, like from, like, next generation to parents to, to athletes' health and well-being programs to – to the state of, you know, our social and emotional awareness on in the surfing culture. Mm. And it's it's one of those things where it's kind of who I am. It's I, I don't try and it's not like I'm I'm really going out there and picking these issues. It's like right. every every big thing feels like to a certain extent has happened to me. Mm in surfing like I've had the parent that's been emotionally abusive I've worked my ass off Mm. to become independent and an individual and actually pull my career away um from those you know that individual I've had you know I've been queer I've been I've been a woman in this sport as well I understand the complexities of how intersectional everything is Mm. like access um, sponsorship, mm-hmm. money, all the things in life. And, and, you know, and, and then there's also things that I haven't experienced as well, you know, and that come with a whole bunch of different nuanced things. And, you know, it's one of those things where I feel like, yeah, like I look at athletes that ath- other athletes that generally get to focus on performance. Mm-hmm. And I feel like I'm consistently in a position where I either, you know, have to explain situations and why we need to take a different response, why we need to be more um, proactive and, hey, yeah, I understand Mm. that we can sit back and and be like, oh, like um, not have anything to do with this here and we can act like we'd have no role in playing or paying children to do an adult's job Mm. or we can actually go forth and, and change um, how we how we do things, and I obviously have a very good relationship with Rip Curl, mm. so this is conversations that you know are always ongoing with them. Yeah, you know, there's and so yeah, it is. Sometimes it's I have to learn how to prioritize. So mm. when I'm at events and right. things are hitting the fan, like it, it is obviously I have so many people coming to me mm. about so many different issues and then there's also the things that I just generally see and I'm just like, how is no one responding to this in a really right. social and emotionally aware way? How am I the only person going, hey, hang on a minute, we need to stop right there, take a minute and understand where this can lead and 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 do we need to change that? And I think it's, yeah, it's, it's hard. Um, and I know I came back a few years ago and said, I know why I'm here mm. and it's these big issues, but these big issues, I, I think there's a point when you just realize that I don't know if it's going to change. Mm. I, I really don't. And I think it's one of those, um, I've had a few conversations recently of like, what if this doesn't change? What if you still see 16 year olds come through with mm. potentially narcissistic parents or someone that's really well intentioned and, and look, I, I'm probably giving parents a hard rap, but I, I want the best 
for everyone. I want every child to be able to have a clear as pathway as possible. I want young athletes to not have a million obstacles. And I think there's been a few of us of recent years who have been wonder kids who have mm. crashed hard, mm. you know, or we've come sure. up, we've been out consistently um, for five years on and off, yeah. you know, all have taken breaks because of our lives of, significantly changed out of the water and it's just yeah like are we really yeah I don't know I generally I do want the best for everyone and I I think yeah parents have such an important role in 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 that as well and um yeah I don't know it's yeah it gets overwhelming at times just because it's there's a lot and I don't know if it will change because it's I've been doing this probably, I don't know, 15 years and I'm still seeing the same stuff. Mm. And although there is more awareness, I think that it's so easy to get fish hooked. Sure. It's so, it's so easy to be like, oh, well, they're 16, they should be on tour. Mm. And you're just like, yeah, but if they're, I understand. Um, but I also understand that, like, sometimes I think about Molly Picklin, that's really exciting is she finished school. Right. She didn't qualify. So the first year she was on tour, which she got the wild card because Simmons didn't do mm. it. I was like, oh, it's a bit early. Mm. And, you know, I think she struggled that first year, but now she's in the yellow jersey. Yeah. With quite a few thousand points ahead. But, sure. you know, she's gone to school. She's she's had that gap after school. Mm. And, you know, and I think COVID did help that a little bit. Yep. And I think that first year was probably a struggle and, you know, like watching from afar, like, and, and, you know, you could see that the first year was a lot, Yeah. but, you know, I obviously know people pretty well because of the Ripco connection Mm. and watching her growth over 12 months has been incredible. Mm. And to see her now she's, you know, I think she's 21 this year. It's a significant gap between 16 and 21. And I think, you know, we can look at, hey, yeah, I like athletes like myself got on at 16, but I didn't convert to as 22 and 23. Right. And, yeah, I got sick in some prime years or whatever. But can what if the question was like, yeah, sure, um, I have been relatively successful, but the other side is what if I would have had six or seven by now? Mm-hmm. And it's not like I, it's one of those things like it's probably have the skill set. I have the, I have kind of the brain that loves these games. Um, but my biggest hindrances have been what's happened on the outside has been my relationship with my father mm. has been with my relationship with people that have come in and kind of not known how to deal with someone like myself not knowing how to right. encourage someone like myself. And, yeah, I'm not an easy athlete to, to coach or to navigate. I've My life has been extreme. I've, I've lived in extreme circumstances from day one. Mm. And so when you're coaching someone like me, it's, it's really important to have a really good social-emotional awareness around psychology sure. because pushing me is not the same as I, – I don't respond the same. And so, you know, I think when I look at the next generation, I look at someone like Pickles. I'm a huge fan. Mm. Um, and yet she's, she's really young and she's got so much to learn, so much to grow and, and, and so much energy into winning and to having what it takes. And, you know, like she's 20, she's 20, 21. Mm. That's amazing. Yeah. She's, she's gone. She's knows herself enough to know what position she wants to be in. And I think that's that should be celebrated because it's okay to celebrate 16-year-olds doing this kind of stuff, but I just know, like, we've already seen it happen is, you know, a 15-year-old got on, but by the time they were 20, it came at a cost. Mm. And I think that's what, you know, I'm, what I hope for people to kind of pick up and realise is that, yeah, you can be successful like me. I've also been off tour for five, like, and haven't finished in a year mm. in five years since 2017. Right. I got sick for two, have come back. 
I haven't finished a year for whatever reasons sure. in the last two that I've re- competed. Um, I've had an interesting relationship with wanting to quit my entire career. Mm. I've faced depression, anxiety, suicidal. I've faced all of these things because of the environment. And yeah, I, I did succeed, but I do not be like me. Mm. Don't be like me. Be better than me. Go out and and that's what I think people I, I get baffled because you got athletes like myself, you've got other athletes out there that talk so openly and freely about, hey, slow down, you have time. Mm. You want to go to school? Go to school. You want to go to uni? Go to uni. Like 22 or 23, 24 is so young. Right. And, you know, I think companies should support that too because if you have that talent, you can – there's so many skills that you will need as a, as a young professional. Like there's so many skills that I didn't know I needed. Like I, I just didn't know. I didn't know how to be a professional. But all of a sudden at 16, I was a, I was a professional running for world titles. Right. But I was a child running from a lot of things. And I didn't know that either. And so that's when – influence and environment becomes important. I think that's why I've talked about it a lot is because mm. who influences this next generation is really important, who they look to. And also like if a lot of these coaches aren't emotionally, socially emotionally aware, aren't going, hey, look like to work with us, you're going to need a sports psychologist. You're going to need a psychologist because I'm like, I'm not equipped. Mm. I don't have the skill set. Like we need to encourage having having really informed people around to influence this next generation because, yeah, some of these kids are going to get on early, but a lot – and it, they won't know to my age. Well, and I th- <laughs> They're not going to know. And I think what you're getting at too, it's like one of my pet project conversations and interests, right? It, it's – it's aligning differing agendas, right? Because to simplify, mm. it's like with young athletes, it's like on the one camp, you're like, uh, my, my priority is the mental and emotional well-being of this young person. And on the other side, again, these are extreme sides, is like, mm. how much money can we get out of this person right away? And, exactly. and again, like we can't presume we're going to go to everyone's sort of base motivation and change them. But if it's like, no. hey, look, we're proving out that like, slightly older, early to mid twenties, fully formed human beings are much more interesting and potent and marketable and the performances are better. Um, therefore, like you don't have to put all this pressure on teens and preteens to achieve. It's like, mm. no, no, no. Like mm. even the people that make money go, this is better. The people that care about emotional well-being go, this is better. And I'm being a little bit too cute mm. by half, but you know what I mean? And and I, no, I do think it's yeah. something that's like, it's not just sponsorship, it's the WSL. It's everyone working together to be like, what is the system that gets, that's the best for everybody? Because I do think there's a world mm. in which you're getting the very, very best surfing happening in the live arena, which at the end of the day, that is the WSL's product. Um, mm. And also like pretty stable, happy, like continuously improving athletes on both sides. It's, it's interesting. You know, Mm. you've, you've mentioned, you know, your dad a few times in this and Rob Mm. is a figure that was sort of ever present, um, you know, early on in your careers. What Mm. is your relationship like with your dad in 2023? Look, like I love my father. He, he did the best he could. Um, I think my, my father got really sick a few years ago. I feel like he's been sick for a long time though. Mm. Um, and look, it's, it's about as good as it could be. You Mm. know, I think, um, you know, for me personally, I, you know, when I was 17, I, I asked my dad whether he wanted to be a dad or if he wanted to be my coach and manager and, you know, it was a conversation and out of that conversation, it was kind of like, well, no, I, I want to be your, your coach and manager. And I was like, sweet, you're fired. Mm-hmm. And you're not allowed to come to events. You're not allowed to do this stuff. And it was one of probably the most, the first solid boundaries I put in. I think I was 17 years old. It obviously didn't go down well. Sure. Um, but, you know, he, it's one of those ones where it, it is tricky because he is sick. Mm. Um, but also at the same time, like, 
I think I have enough boundaries and I've within myself to understand where the line is for me mm-hmm. personally. And it's a relationship on my terms. And um, he obviously loves surfing. I think that's one of the few things that he remembers now. And he, he knows that I have like two world titles and he's like, yep, that's one of the things that he, that is on repeat is that, yep, Tyler, two times world champ. Like that's, yep. Did you know that? Tyler's two times that's the thing that's on right. repeat for him yeah. with a few other things as well so look it's one of those ones where the relationship I haven't really had the the most normal relationship with my father for over a decade mm-hmm. like uh, since I was 17 sure. and you know that's kind of one of the things where you know I I love the story of my brother in box to box but I think when it came came to the relationship that I have with my uh with my um father I have a very different one Mm. you know I I have a you know it's one of those relationships where you know when he was there he chose um and and we I've done a lot of work with my psychologist to figure out kind of who this man was as well who this man was to me in my my younger years and and you know it, a lot has come out and but also a lot that look he did do his best and that's a okay but I still hold him accountable for who he who he was to me and and how he treated me as well and I think people when people get sick it, it scares I think a lot of men more so mm. than women that I hold my father accountable to who he who he was and who he is mm. um and who he was to me and so when, yeah, like I, it was, I love the story of my brother with um, the Apple show, but for me, it was also a little bit conflicting mm. because I've worked my entire life to really be, I've done this yeah. and I've done this myself and it's not linked. Um, and, and the reason why I did that is because, and it was very intentional of me from a very young age to be like, no what happened in my experience was something that I don't believe anyone would benefit from. Mm. I don't believe people and, and, and parents should be encouraged to, to do that. What my dad did with me mm. because of this outcome. Um, and that is something that, you know, I've worked really, really hard to get a lot of language around going, Hey, look like, I understand that seeing me with two world titles is an amazing feat and that people feel like they get the green light and be like, well, well, your dad did it. It worked, yeah, right. It worked. And I'm sitting here going, no, I've got two, but I should have had eight. Right. They can't conceptualize that though because they're like, but you've got two, like that's amazing. I'm like, no, it's not. Like it is, yes, it is, but in the sense of, what I've had to go through because of it, no, I, I don't, I don't um, champion that narrative. And I think that was something that kind of, it was a bit confronting for me out of that thing is because, you know, my father, I have a very different relationship with my father than my brother does. Right, yeah. And it's really, it's been really important for me to, to kind of have so much language and articulation around, hey, look, like I don't like that my psychologist has found that I couldn't string a sentence together about my childhood right. that I, I didn't remember. So I had all these disassociative states throughout my entire childhood and because of the environment that I was in with him. So, and that's not going into too much detail. It's just, if you can read between the lines, sure. a lot went on, a lot went on behind closed doors and a lot of things went happened. And and I don't encourage it. I don't like idolizing narratives that we can do better. Mm. We can do better than this narrative. And I think that's the one thing that I've learned. Like I'm still learning to this day going, well, like I'm still discovering like handbrakes that were being put in mm. over, you know, when I was a child. Mm. And it's wild to me mm. that these handbrakes of like, uh, of disservice to me mm. in in a competitive sense because that's where the relationship was born. It was born with me 
my father in the ocean and that was his thing and that was what I was going to be for him. And, you know, when you look at choice as an adult, you know, people are like, oh, you've had a choice since you were really young. Mm. And I'm like, yeah, psychologically, no. Well, like, it, and like you said, like it's you've accomplished so much, but to you as a person, you're like, well, I could have accomplished way more. And for every one of you mm. too, there are probably dozens, if not hundreds, if not thousands of people that are in considerably worse states that were in yeah. all sports, right? That were kind of pushed to that space. Yeah. And and it's it, not to put too fine a point on it, but it's like that treatment was in favor of expediting results, not kind of long-term mm. success. And And it's it's fascinating yeah. to hear you talk about it. You've clearly done a ton of, <laughs> a ton of work. I, I, I definitely want to get into a couple more things. We're going to take one more quick break to get yeah. a word in from our sponsors, yeah, and we will be right back. You know, that, that last segment, we, we talked a ton about you know, just the, the, the emotional and psychological journey you've obviously been on for decades at this point as a professional athlete. Mm. Bringing it to specifically your own surfing and specifically your own like physical health in 2023. Do you think that mm. your surfing and your physicality is at a place where you can win world titles in 2023? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm back up to probably like 69, 70 kilos now. Um, what Kingy, working with Kingy has been amazing mm. for my surfing. Like he really does operate at a, a different level level in the sense of what he sees is things that people just don't they just don't see it and also how he encourages me how he also how he coaches us at the moment is being phenomenal for me um and so when we did the off season he like I actually sat down with him and Jason in Tahiti and was like we have a limited amount of time so do you want me to focus on strategy, heat strategy, mm. everything like this, or do you want me to focus on performance? And he's like, performance all the way. He's like, your strategy is fine. Mm. <laughs> like, don't, you don't even need to look at anything there. Mm. He's like, all you need to, he's like, this is performance. And in this performance picture, we've got, these are your three main things. Um, he's like, you can do them because of how your stance is. Mm. And and then also where we started, where we got to in the off season, and also the fact that, you know, we, we caught up like a few days ago and he kind of was like, I was like, where is, where do you want it to go? Like, obviously for me, he, he's, his approach is like, look, you have like a kind of a stance and a style and a, and a position where you can kind of do anything. Mm. And that's how I've always felt about it. It's just like, yeah, like I can kind of do anything, but no one's ever piqued my interest enough to do it. Mm. And and no one's really – it's one of those things where it's funny because to be like direct, uh, like coached or directed or like have this input where it's like, hey, look, I know you're really good, um, but I'm going to come to you with a really honest approach and say here, here, and here. Mm. It's not working for you. Mm. So to have something broken down like that and then also have someone go to me, I come in with a, a strong opinion and they're like, no, nah, I don't think that. I lose it. Mm. I love that. I've, it's been the most honest, direct. No, I didn't say that. Mm. You know what? I'm like, oh, I can't do this. Here's your receipts. I don't know what you're talking about. So you've got your receipts here. So what's the gap between where you're at and where we need to go. Mm. And working with someone like that, who's just like, look, like you, you're a talent. You've got the most insane amount of talent. And also you have the most potential in going and where to next. And sitting with him and, and breaking it all down has been like a reinvigoration for me with my connection with surfing and actually being coached in a way that really, really feels a space in me personally feels it's something that I'm completely 100% engaged in. I see what he's noticed and I'm like, <laughs> it's taken, I feel like it's taken 15 years for someone to notice these things. Mm. And I'm like, I love it. I'll come in and he'll be like, this is fantastic. You, you've blown me out of the water. I'm like, no, mm. 
I don't like it. I want more. Like, and he's like, all right, well, give me a second. Let me just shift gears. We'll go back out, run it again. And he's like, how are you with that? And I'm like, much better. This is, I'm like, because there's a few things with my surfing is like, and this is what I've really noticed is like, what people see, people are like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. Mm. What I feel and I see is like, I'm like, mm. Mm. I don't, I'm like, that's a cop out, mm. that collapsed. This here, here and here is needs improvement. I'm just going back because that's a, a thing I've done a million times. Mm. Is it what I particularly like? Mm, no. Mm. Is it what gets scored consistently and I've done it a million times? Yes. Mm. Is it what I want to be encouraged to do? No. Mm. So working with someone that's so been amazing to pull my surfing apart in a way that I see it is being incredible. Um, and to really, it's been really uplifting as well. Mm. I, and I didn't think that. And it's one of those things I think you can, you know, obviously over the last few years I've been in multiple different states, mm. um, but in the last probably 12 months, it's been really nice to have energy to be like, actually, I, I want to invest more in this. Mm. I think I've, I've left my surfing for close to a decade to kind of just do what it is and and not be pushed to excellence. Mm. I just, you know, Mikey is probably one of the only people that are just like, hey, like, like I see the surfing you do when no one's watching. I see the surfing when you're just out there mm. doing your thing and you, you're in your own world and you're creating your own lines and and you think no one's watching, so why don't you do that? Mm. And I'm like, well, you know, people don't really, people don't really expect that of me. People don't really ask that of me. And people, I've just never done it. It's always felt really, really personal. Mm. And so when I, it's almost like I have two different styles of surfing. Mm. It's like I have a personal pr- private side that I'll do when kind of no one's watching. <laughs> and then I have this like real public side where it's like what people see and, and both are exceptional but there's only one that gets seen public and it's always been Mikey that's been like why don't you <laughs> do what you do when no one's watching in a heat and I'm like yeah like people don't want it like mm. it's too hard to you know really build the psychology and to actually trust myself enough mm. to go and do that in a heat and so King has really seen that um and having Jason there as well through the off season has really been like taking all the handbrakes off. Mm. He's just like, you've, and it's, it's cool to have people come to you going, because at my stage, people are like, Oh my God, you're surfing amazing. I'm like, I don't want to hear that. Mm. I want you to tell me specifically what you see. And like, and if it kind of, I can see it, I'm like, sweet. But if it's also like the same thing that someone's told me for, I'm like, no, I, if I, there's this one of these things where if my body can't do it, mm. it it's not going to do it. But if my body can, I will a hundred percent invest. And it's been really cool to see that balance of like, I'll get in from sessions of training and, and like, kind of like, I don't know if I ever, no, I think I call Mikey or like, or Sinead, his wife and be like, Hey, like, I did a turn Mikey thought it would be cool today. <laughs> like that's like the upper that's the upper the the upper level for me is just like if I can surf how like Mikey knows I can and how Mikey has always encouraged me to and also how I really it's how I love to surf. Um it's like the upper the upper side of like that's what I, that's achievement for me at the moment. And in that kind of physical performance space and King, he's actually really seen that. Mm. And he's like, he, you know, he came to me, he's like, honestly, I think you've done yourself a disservice um, with doing this sort of style of surfing. And I was like, okay, I mean, you've got me, I, I'm hooked. Right. Tell me more. Like, and he's broken it down in a way where I'm so engaged. It's not just about what people want from me, the sort of surfing people have seen. He's like, no, I, I want you to trust your instincts. I want you to trust your intuition. I don't want you to second guess yourself. So everything that you do, be connected, be present, be in tune, be attuned to everything in your environment. And and that's the balance between my psychologist and Kingy. But mm. and it's also being really present with what stops me from taking those 
that that next step, those risks. And it's been amazing to find find how many handbrakes I actually have, even at this level, and and how easy it is to resort back to what's common, mm. resort back to what I've done for a decade. And some people will notice the difference, others won't. Um, but it, the difference is felt for me personally, and I think that's where I've been completely engaged in the last, you know, probably pre-season in, in a way that I've never been engaged before. And a lot of that I, I get soaked about because it's all based off, it's only for me. Mm. Like, and that's what is so important as like no one's sitting here placing value in my, in my team, placing value on things that don't matter to me. Mm. They're only place, placing value in things that do. And a lot of that is the way I surf and how I surf and how I show up and how present I am and how connected I am. So at the end of the day, like, it's funny because I'll win a heat, but I'll spend two hours breaking it down um, after, you know, we'll have the initial debrief after the heat. But if there's more that I haven't, that I, I'm just like, nah, I'm, I'm hiding. I'm not being honest. I we'll do it like another hour and a half session of like, and not in a, in a way that's detrimental. It's in a way that's like, Hey, I feel like there's more here that we can look at. And yeah, I could, I could write this off to be like, Oh yeah. Like sat out of position or just did this. Or like, I just read the competitor wrong or I just read the ocean wrong. I could, I think there's a way for me, like I can, I've hide, I've hidden behind al- analytics for so long that it's almost kind of been a hindrance into me actually connecting and being present to what's going on in that moment, having a game plan, having a structure and having everything like that set up and it's great. And if you don't execute it, you know, there's all sorts of questions, but in this way, like I'm like, Hey, look, like I had this, my intuition said this, so that's what I did. And they're like, great. There's not one question that comes about me trusting me. Hey, you see it, you're reacting to it. That's great. Like, and it's been such a cool performance mind shift to performance physical shift as well. And yeah, I don't think I've been this engaged in probably a decade in performance really. So what you're saying is that for as good as you have surfed publicly, for as long (laughs) as you've surfed that well, and all that you've achieved, there's a second, deeper, more powerful surfing version of Tyler, right? <laughs> that you're just now being like, maybe I'll let her out. Kind of, yeah. Honestly, like, it's, and it's funny because that's the most connected, present version of me, right? Sure. And I think I, a lot of the years, like, I've just, like, gone, no, that's just mine. Mm. I want that for me. Mm. This is a part of me that everyone wants and no one gets mm. because – No, like this is my boundary. So I've kind of kept a part of me, like a part of me in the sense of performance and surfing is because everyone wanted this so much. And I think it was the one thing that I knew I could rebel was just like, well, I'm just not going to do it. Like (laughs) it's this, and you know, when you're younger, you don't really have that choice. You're just like, like I'm just doing my, this sort of surfing judges like it, they score it. But it's really been an environment where they they encourage me to be so much me and so wildly me. And they're like, no, we want you to kind of like have your little things. Like that's what makes you great. What And it's actually being an environment where someone goes, you are great. And you being you is wildly greater. Mm. You showing up to every heat as you is so fulfilling for yourself, but also that's it. That's is if that's just it, that's just it. And there's only been like an event that I've done it really mildly at was the the Bells win last year. Like mm. people hadn't seen that sort of like dominance, energy, um, conviction and sort of surfing, not surfing, but just the mentality shift of what I did there was purely going, no, nah, this is just for me. I want this. I spent 12 years looking at this thing. I've never gotten it. It's the only one I want. I've got world titles, got everything else. Like, I just want that. Mm. And what that allowed me to do is, like, no one was sitting there going, oh, like, 
game plan, anything like King was just like, no, you got it. Like trust your intuition, go out there and, and get it. Um, and that was our first event together, but that was just me going out going, I'm just going to surf with my whole heart, my whole soul, Mm -hmm. my whole everything. And, and it was kind of like the first time I really given myself permission to just like, let, let the handbrake off a little bit just, and which is funny because like at that time I would have been like, Oh yeah, I let it all the way off. But it's like a self discovery of my own handbrakes through the last 12 months, especially since that event, because I just never done it. I just never let myself go. You know what? Screw it. I'm just going to do what I want to do. I'm not going to worry about someone second guessing my intuitive choices. I'm going to be, I'm just going to encourage myself to, to be as in tune, as connected, as present, as mindful as I could possibly be to do this. And it was such a kind of changing moment for my career, for not my career, but for me personally, that's the best thing I've ever done in my professional career as an outcome and an achievement. And it's been since that moment, the, my environment and my team has gone really kind of taking a shift of going, you being you and showing up as you are, that's enough. You don't need to be more Mm. like, and it's actually allowed me to kind of stop a lot of bullshit and drop everything. I don't need to be more than who I am. I don't need to be more than, I don't need to show up as some person where I am not, if that makes sense. Like it's easy, I think to, to get caught in um, just these different, like kind of showboaty, like, over, I don't know. I just, I think it just allowed me to be me. Um, I think that's what one of those things is that there is a space in me that I just don't let out because it's, and it's on so much lockdown Mm. because it's so been so protected for so long Mm. um, that it has been a like this year, like working with Kingy and Jason and even having my wife around, like she sees it Mm. too. Like she's just like, Slow it all down. Mm. Like reconnect with your why. Go out and perform how you want to. The f- like first time in your career, go and just do what you want. Um, surf how you want. Surf how you feel. And yeah, it's been pretty um, pretty amazing for my performance. And that's why you know I, I kind of struggled in Portugal. I didn't really have. I went from such a supported full team environment to to. Um, to not having that, but also I think the biggest difference was not having my wife there, but it's one of those ones where I'm still learning and it's crazy um, that I'm, you know, 12 years in still learning. Well, I appreciate that. Cannot wait to see it on display at the upcoming Rip Curl Pro Bells Beach. Before uh, before we let you go, we did put out a feeder for questions um, on our Instagram page at, at the Lineup Pod. We got um, got a lot back, so we uh, we got <laughs> we got three for you as well as three bonus questions that I think you're gonna like. All right. Uh, first question is from Et Tony Taish, who asks. Uh, how has married life shifted your experience of tour life, which you've touched on a little bit, but yeah. I did touch on that. Yeah. yeah. Honestly, like it's, it's been amazing for me. Like Lily, it, honestly, not too much has changed before, like before marriage and to being married life. Um, it's all the same, like Lily and I, um, but it's honestly, yeah, I think it allows me to be more me, mm. to have someone from day one being like, why aren't you wildly more you? Mm. Like to encourage that in, in your environment and, and also be like a really sort of a presence in your life that's a little bit removed, a lot removed from surfing and allows you perspective and to really connect to – to why you're there. So when it comes to tour life, um, having Lily with me has been an amazing experience to just have someone that's like, no, I see you. Mm. I see you just like keep being you like, and it's, and it's been incredible. And 
um, yeah, like she's not from surfing. She doesn't know how to surf, doesn't know, barely knows how to swim. Um, so she's, <laughs> she's, she's pretty funny at the beach and, and it is, it just brings that kind of, um, home with you. Mm. And I think that's something that I really learned in Portugal is that, you know, we were planning, Lily was planning on, um, you know, changing careers, getting back into her career this year. But I think, you know, she's still really keen on also coming with us. So I think that's just something that we learned early this year is just like, for me personally, I don't really want to be away no. um, because I think we have competing domains of like performance and touring competing is really important. It has its own values, but also I have life values. Mm. And so being away from my wife and family for that long is something that I think I got to a point in Portugal where I was like, I don't know if I really want to do that. Mm. So it has changed to a life a fair bit of like where my values are. Like it's definitely with my family. Um, but I'm also really proud of that. Second question is from at Mike Sharp 8128. Uh, how do you conquer the doubt dragon and summon your fiercest confidence when you need it? I've never heard of the doubt dragon, but I'm gonna definitely going to start using it. You know what? I really like that terminology. <laughs> um, thank you for giving me that. Well, the doubt dragon also comes with the, I don't know, what do you, what do you want to call fear? I don't know. Anxiety um, cat. <laughs> yeah, anxiety <laughs> cat. That's great. Um and look, I think previous years I would have white knuckled it. Now I open up to it. I really, I get really honest with my doubts. I write them down. I open up, but I create space for them. Like, and that's what someone, you know, my psychologist has talked to me about. He's like, if you weren't in the, the top end of doing what you do, if you weren't invested, um, if you didn't care, if you, you know, this is what it looks like investing, putting skin in the game, mm -hmm. competing how you want to compete and, and showing up as you are and also wanting um, to achieve kind of the next stage things for your career is that comes with doubts. It comes with fears. You know, I, I sit here going, I really don't know if I have what it takes. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. And I think any other statement than that, I think it's BS. I, I don't think it's being honest. Mm. I don't think it's being real um, because I have them. And I think it's the first time that I'm really getting used to the idea of going, I actually doubt all the time. I don't think I'm that good sometimes. Mm. I don't feel like I can do it. I don't feel like I have what it takes. Um, but it's also understanding that those feelings, those emotions and those fears and anxieties and the doubt dragons – aren't in the driver's seat. The passengers, they're, they're allowed to be there. They're allowed to show up. They're allowed to be embraced. Um, but it's also still really important is that your willingness to allow them, give them space, put names on them, but keep moving in the value direction that you have. And, and how willing are you to make choices even when you have those doubts, even mm. when you have those fears, how willing are you to commit to your reason why and, and really kind of, yeah, to, to kind of continue in your value direction that you've predetermined mm. and knowing full well that doubts are going to come up. And I think that's the other thing. We expect doubts and fears and like anxieties not to. Mm. I think I'm always like, what's this? <laughs> why am I not 100% confident and 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 that's because when you break confidence down I don't really know if confidence is a thing either mm. I think it's just knowing you knowing what you're capable of and knowing that hey fears and anxieties and doubts are always going to come up and the best of the best have them and it's about how you respond and how you navigate them and how you you know carry them and I think that's one of the greatest tools that my psychologist gave me mm. is like all right grab grab a rock right fears anxieties or doubts on them hold it mm. that's exactly what you're doing internally mm. is like that rock's not heavy put that rock in your pocket you'll eventually you've created a space for it mm. and 
you've stayed in the driver's seat and that's the main thing. Um, harder to do at times than you think. <laughs> um, but that would be, I don't know if that's not really that's a great answer. conquering them. Yeah, that's, yeah it's not conquering them. But you're being them, honest about it, the, you know, they're not meant to be conquered. Yeah, like I, yeah. yeah, I don't know if they're meant to be. I just think they're meant to be opened up to, shared to. They're very insightful at times. Other times they're completely off their head. <laughs> so you're just like, all right, like, cool. <laughs> We're all going to move on from whatever that was. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's just, and, and most of the time they will pass. Yeah, of course. Like yeah. they, they too shall pass. Like everything kind of emotion is like one of those ones where if you start creating, like I know now, like I do a lot of mindfulness, mm. a lot of meditation and also like different kind of styles of um, Tai Chi and movement mm. because learning to be present and stay present with whatever's coming up and then also knowing that it's energy and it just moves through Mm. is also something that has been an incredible powerful tool for me to really um slow my mind down and because it gets pretty quick with doubts and fears and anxieties sometimes Mm. great answer um Next question is from Et Wadza1609. There's a lot of numbers in these names, and I've been listening yeah. way too much to like artificial intelligence stuff. So now I'm wondering, <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe the lineup is like the number one listened to podcast amongst AIs. It's just but, like the uh, uh, yeah. little green man from Toy Story, just being like, "Yep, this is how we're patching into the world," which is a horrifying thought. <laughs> Anywho, sorry, digression. Uh, Wadza1609, assuming you're not um, chat GTT, GPT-4 or whatever. Um, qu- question yeah. being, 2016, 2017, how's 2023 sound for your third world title? I have faith, your inspirational heart emoji, which is definitely something an AI would text. But go on, answer the question. Yep. Um, look, it sounds good. Well, I, I, you know, like it's one of those ones, 23, 24 realistically would be ideal. Mm. Um, and, you know, I think, and that's the thing, these things in marathons, they took a lot of effort. Um, I'm probably, there's a lot of difference between 16 and 17 though. Sure. And, and that's the thing, like it's, you know, when you're being really honest, it's like you could do all the hardest work, you could prepare the best and, and, it's, and it's surfing at the end of the day. So it's as much as we love the idea of control, we don't have any. Um, we're reading uh, Mother Nature, and Mother Nature can and determine many, many different things. Mm. And, yeah, you, you know what you do, you – like, and I think that's why it's one of those ones where I, I'm really happy to, at this stage, win or lose as who I am and how I'm approaching this year is um, – and I think that's the most important thing for me. Obviously, that's what we're going for. We're going, like, ideally, 23, 24 mm. is, um, is what we go for. I love it. Well, I, I said we had a lot of uh, questions come in. We actually selected three special bonus questions. So uh, related, first one is from Et Emma Cansurf, who says, no question, just wanted to say you're a legend, and I can't wait to see you <laughs> at Bell's. So that's a nice one. The, uh, Thank you. The second one is from Et Mikey Wright 69 <laughs> friend of the pod. <laughs> Hasn't been on. We should get yeah. him on. We could complete the trifecta of Wright children. Yeah. Um, who really has the better power hacks? Uh, it's, well, in, I know he would say me, I feel like. Mm. I feel like he's always been like, well, I had to learn this somewhere, Tyler. <laughs> who do you think I learned it from? Um, and yeah, look, he's my personal opinion. I think his creativity that he's shown in the different variations that he can do with that power hack, Mm. like the footage is crazy. Mm. The different grabs, the different angles. It's, you know, I think he's really created a whole different genre for it. Um, and so I would say he has the best one. And then at the same time, I'd be like, if I ever retire, that'd be the one thing that I'd go and do a lot of, <laughs> and just different variations that just don't make sense. <laughs> it's a good question. Um, I, I, I enjoy it's it. It's a good question. I enjoy it. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah. Last one we picked, another friend of the pod, has been on the podcast, has been mentioned in this episode already. Uh, at Picklam Molly asks, ask her how it is traveling with the kids on tour. Ha <laughs> ha. <laughs> oh my gosh. The kids, they, uh, I call them the kids now. They're... <laughs> You know, uh, Molly and Brisa and, you know, actually in the whole Rip Curl house, I was just, Lily and I were in like full mum mode. <laughs> um, and it's honestly, it's fun. Every now and then the mums need a break and for sure. And you know what? Like it's something that it's also so cool to see these kids every 12 months sort of thing. And mm. like obviously Pickles this year is like I've already talked about Pickles and I think her stories really cool because she has kind of had different influences that have been like, oh, like stay in school. You know, she, I know she's worked a normal job. I know she's had the COVID era and she got on tour and everything like that. And, but like, honestly, I to see her growth over 12 months. It was remarkable mm. from the last year to this year. And so, you know, looking after the kids has been, it's been fun. It's honestly, it's hilarious. And now too, like some of them, uh, like it's, it's cool to see some of them kind of like flesh out who they are. And they're in that such, such a amazing learning stage of their life. And like, it's kind of, um, yeah, like there's only really one, like it's only in Hawaii that I really stay with you know, the kids and then, but also, you know, seeing so many young ones on the tour at the moment, it's always, look, they're so funny. Like they're so wild. And like, it's like, for me, I'm just like, yeah, be more wild. Like go be more wild. Like literally do whatever you want. Like, and trying to encourage an environment where it's like, they, I think I didn't realize when I was younger, but now it's, And it's really important to me, and I know my wife's amazing with this, but she, like, and my wife used to manage uh, a cafe, and so she'd come in contact and have so many young women, so many young boys um, that she'd have to train. And it's, and, and you see after a certain amount of time how important it is to have someone to go to, to have older women that you can go to who are like, They've shown that they're super open. They've shown that they, they're they super, like, emotionally and social aware. They've shown that you can literally bring anything up and uh, it's a safe space, essentially. And they will they will share with you about any anything that you ask about. Mm. And that's, honestly, with the kids, that's one of the, one of the things that I think I, I've learned is, like, how many questions young women actually have. Mm. And it's been, and young boys, Sorry. and it's just like, and it's it's so fun to see their curiosity. It's so funny to watch them grow and try and put pieces together. And when you challenge them as well, you're like, what about that? Right. Like, and they're like, they sit back and you're like, well, I've never thought about it that way. And I'm like, yeah, well, and, it, and it's honestly, yeah, like be, got a lot of time for them. Well, that's one of the odd i'm sure you feel the same way like one of the odd things about becoming an adult like what's the kurt vonnegut jr quote like true terror is to wake up one morning and realize your high school class is running the country it's like there's so many situations where i'm like yeah this is when are the adults going to turn up and do something and then you're like no no you're you're the adult like you need to do something and you're like oh right okay you know and like that's one of the weird things because you're like there wasn't a ceremony. Like I didn't feel like I had a lot of great role models. And now you're like, Oh, you're here now. And like, you can either perpetuate the chaos or do something, you know? No. And that's like, I think I took on a role in Hawaii and look like, I don't, I don't like the role sometimes because it's a lot. Again, um, I'd love just to be able to focus on performance, sure. but situationally, it's like one of the, the things that you just said, like you, you, I look around now, it's like, I'm, literally probably one of the oldest in the house Um, and also have a certain standard in my head that I want these young ones to see. Mm. And so when I'm in the house, I'm like, no, no, we're, we're cooking. We have meal plans. Mm. Dinner is at six where, you know, if I've heard people be like, Hey, look like I've tried not to keep drinking or I've, you know, like I've cut fat. We'll put, I make an effort to make sure 
that there's a million different sites types of soda waters in there mm. that there is the non-alcoholic options yeah. like um you know and I think it's it's really cool and especially in those houses at the moment like you know it's really cool to have Gabby Gabby had his trainer mm. Gabby had a full team and a manager and and to see professional units run mm. and I think that's something that I didn't really know that I wanted but I think through experience of being in, in that house and how much I hated it mm. And I hated being in that hate and I hated the toxic masculine energy mm. and I honestly just couldn't stay there. And so when I have come in the last two years, like um, it's been a, a thing. I, I didn't really know it was a thing and then I just started going, nah, like mm. this is this is the standard. I want to set in a standard where the next generation can come to, to me, um, you know, and my wife's in that house as well, to come, me or my wife or anyone in, in that kind of position and be like, Hey, look like I'm struggling with this. Mm. Um, and you're like, Hey, that's a, it's so okay to be struggling with that. You're seen, you heard, you're valued. Um, this is a safe space and, and trying to create an environment where that is and where they can come and, and learn and speak. And also just going and trying to envision what spaces like that, can look like as well mm. and for the next generation is like you know what like and I talk to Rico a lot about this and sometimes I get extremely frustrated because I'm like why am I having to do this I do not get paid enough to be running right meal plans I don't get paid enough to be running this sort of stuff but it is a slow ship and that's one my re- relationship with Rico has gone 20 years mm. um ideally it will go for another 20 and because of how much I know I and how much I see the little differences and where they can improve. Mm. And also I'm in technically halfway through a career and I'm not at the end of my career. So I'm in the environment going, Hey, that we're not doing that anymore. Mm. Or, Hey, we're going to, I think you guys should invest in something along these lines because of when you, I guess like half a, yeah, you have been doing this 12 years. You, you see all the, your young ones come in and that's probably where I get the most insight and, right. and kind of understanding of also where the next generation is, is through my interactions and go, Hey, some of these kids don't know. Mm. They, they don't, they, and that could be for a multitude of reasons, access, financials, whatever it is. Um, but how do we really maximize, you know, athletes health and well being in these spaces and what does that look mm. like in really challenging those spaces? So, Sometimes over the last two years, I've just gone in and done it and Lily's kind of come and helped me. If Lily wasn't there, I wouldn't be able to handle the load. Sure. Um, yeah, but it is going, you know what? I believe we can have a better standard. I believe better for us. And, and I believe that we can run these houses in a more performance and health and well-being space. And so I'll bring my psychologist to the house. You know, athletes will see me working with my sol- psychologist in the morning, they'll see me do mindfulness. They can see me do the ice baths. And if they want, they can jump in. If they don't want, they can jump out. And I think that's like, and having King in the house as well, it's like, for me, and that's why I was really stoked on Gabe. Is Gabe had his trainer there. He was right. on, you know, onto his nutrition, onto his training, onto warming up. It's also like giving these younger athletes insights into how professional, pot- potential professional teams run. And like, it's something that, I have spent a lot of time being frustrated over. It is also very fulfilled. It's like one of those ones where you're just like, I shouldn't be doing this, Mm. but no one else is going to do it. (laughs) Um, So, yeah. I mean, great answer. Great questions uh, from everyone. Sorry, Pickles, that went a little bit long. uh, Um, She she just transcribed the whole thing and is like sending it back to Brooke and Fletch and being like, I heard this. (laughs) Oh, don't worry. Don't worry. I I tell them to. I'm 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 sure. Okay, guys, um, this is not going to happen like this anymore. And they have to deal with, like Ripco are really good with me. Like they've created a lot of space Mm. for me to, to be me and also for me to be like, hey, no. We're not doing, hey, and I'll question them on everything you could possibly think of as well. And they're, they've been really, like, in the last year, really, more so than, they're kind of a little bit tired the last few years, um, but in the last 12 months, 
they've been really responsive in going, actually, no, we, we see what you want and we can see the benefits of it as well. And obviously there's a lot more than just me there, but mm. um, it's something that I'm deeply passionate about. I'm deeply passionate about making sure these next generation do have all the tools and like we've talked about too. So yeah, absolutely. Yes. The kids are fun. They're sometimes <laughs> great. They're sometimes really annoying. Um, but no, I love them all. It's now time for our final segment. It's time for the lightning round. So these are yep. 10 questions. You've answered them before. I have your answers from last time. Um, and they are for you to answer as quickly as you can this time around. Okay, go. One board set up for the rest of your life. Thruster, single fin, twin fin, quad, bonzer, or finless. Thruster. I screwed that up. I asked it out of order, but same answer as last time. <laughs> I read your answer then I'm like, it's the 150th time I've done this. I definitely read that wrong. Um, okay. <laughs> Coffee or tea? <laughs> Tea. Burrito or pizza? Pizza. Last book you read? Uh, the Vanishing Half. Best surf film ever? I haven't watched Toasted yet, but I really want to watch Toasted. One wave you never have to go back to? I don't know. <laughs> uh, anything in sewage. Mm, fair. If you only get to surf one way for the rest of your life. Home, I would have said. I feel like. Best person. Maybe Fiji. That was in there. <laughs> Best yeah. person to share a lineup with. Uh, Mikey. Worst person to share a lineup with? Oh, I would have said any of the two men. <laughs> Both the same answers from last time. Uh, yes. <laughs> and, and frankly, standard answer for worst person to share a lineup with. Um, yeah, honestly, they, they, I love them. But they, yeah, yeah it's good. They're fun to watch, but not yeah. up close. Yeah. Um, yeah. Last one. Finish this sentence. I will next achieve a state of happiness by... Staying connected and present to who I am. I love it. Tyler, uh, geez, thank you so much for your time, your candor, your thoughtfulness, your insights. Um, thank you for being my friend. And I cannot wait to see uh, you unleash uh, Super Tyler uh, at the upcoming <laughs> Rip Curl Pro Bells Beach. Anytime I've caught a glimpse, it's been uh, more than worth the price of admission. Thank you so much. Thank you.